I wish somebody a happy Easter this last week that I knew was a believer, and they said, we don't celebrate Easter. I thought, how can you not celebrate the greatest event, historical thing that took place in the world? They wanted me to say Resurrection Sunday. Well, I just want you to know, (laughs) I'm going to say Happy Easter, Happy Resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I think we ought to have them all. This is the Lord's Day. I've entitled today's message, The Last Breakfast. One or two of you might have caught that. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 12. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, or excuse me, Simon Peter, Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for these accounts that have been uh, recorded for us to help us to understand what took place uh, on that, during that time, on that day, especially during this time of Jesus' resurrection from the grave to ascension to the Father. Father, I pray that we'll know that these words have been recorded for us, not just to hear a good story, but to learn from it, to, to engage it, to experience it. Uh, Father, that it might help us to live lives that are uh, faithful unto you, Father, righteous unto you, and being able to be used by you to carry on your work that you began. So, Lord, I pray that we'll surrender our hearts here in this place today to hear what you have to say to us. I pray that we'll have the courage to receive that word And I pray that we'll have the courage to then live it out. And I pray for your messenger, Father. I pray for lack of distraction. I pray that my mind will be focused and just surrender to the Holy Spirit, Father, that you would lead and guide in everything that is said here for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a great season it's been preparing for this celebration. We had a great time in our Lenten study. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Pastor Dan led us through a discussion on the book by Leonard Sweet, From Tablet to Table. And our preparation then culminated with Pastor Dan leading us through a Christian understanding and experience of a Seder meal. Now, I'll have to say that's the second Seder meal I've been to. The first one I actually went to the Jewish synagogue. A number of us got together. We went up there and and it was, I mean, the whole deal. It was, it was an incredible experience. And so I, I'm going to come full confession here this morning. It's the best way to confess your sins before the, each other, right? I, I'm surprised I did not get an amen out of any of that. <laughs> the confession is this. I thought, why are we doing this? You know, I don't get hung up on a lot of things. And, I, and I, I even maybe try to fight the fact that we try to be so Jewish in some things and not in others. And, and it's just a tension with me. But I am so glad we came. I'm so glad that we participated in that. 
You know, I've known uh, Pastor Dan for 10 to 15 years. I've lost him. I couldn't find his pink shirt. There he is. And uh, this last nearly two years of serving along with him and experiencing things, uh, I've got to know him in a deeper and greater way and so appreciate what he brings uh, to, he, he takes something that's very complex and, and brings it and helps us to see the larger picture and then and shows us how we can apply it to our lives and learn from it. And so I, I was so grateful. That was kind of what I experienced uh, Thursday night and then multiple other times, but especially this past Thursday night. And then April and I started watching a series on Netflix that says we were the lucky ones. And it's about the Polish Jews and their plight during uh, the World War II. And they began, one of the opening scenes is they were having a Seder. And Dan, you'll be happy to know. We were going, oh, we know what that, we know what they're doing. We know what they're saying. And so it, it was so good. And so, Dan, I want to thank you uh, for that and for all that you uh, lead us through in that. In one of the lessons we learned that night as Dan led us through that Seder meal was the importance of remembering and telling the story of Jesus. We were challenged, I think, uh, but also encouraged that we remember and tell the story often, one, so we learn it. We learn it so often we don't really know the story. We need to know it, and we need to know it so that we can then engage with it, experience it, and then believe it. One of our responsibilities with this story is to pass it on to the next generation. It's been given to us. We need to give it to them. We need to learn this story, to know it, and to believe it so that we will have the confidence that when we're out sharing this story with those who have never heard it, that they might come to Christ in salvation and become a part then of the story. For me, the resurrection story is full of miracles, wonders, and mystery. Some of those miracles include, what do you think would be the first one? Resurrection. Thank you for the one person participating. Resurrection. Absolutely, that should be at the top. I also think these appearances that he's made, you know, being able to keep the identity from others and then revealing himself at the right time, like Mary, the disciples of note, the two on the road to Emmaus. And then isn't it incredible what he did with Thomas? I think one of the miracles that we oftentimes overlook on this day is also his ascension. The wonders include the promise of his return. I think it's a wonder of the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But one of the wonders that we get to experience in his resurrection in that time that he spent on earth was the authority over the elements of the world. He had authority over all things. The ability to walk through walls. And as we'll see here in just a minute, the ability to know where to fish. And that is a miracle. One of the mysteries for me is where was Jesus when he wasn't with the disciples? I mean, we start to get the understanding that he was with them for times and he was not with them for times. And what did he think they would be doing? And, and of course, we're not told what he was doing and where he was at. But I do think our passage today helps us to explain a little bit of that mystery, especially here. Now, the disciples, after the encounter with Thomas, and this is when Jesus appeared to them. Remember the first time Jesus appeared, Thomas wasn't there. The disciples told Thomas about it. Thomas said, no way am I believing that until I can put my hand in the nail print in his hand, or my finger in the nail print in his hand and put my hand in the side that was pierced. And so Jesus comes back a second time. He says, oh, Thomas, glad you're here. I want you to do something. And he has him put his finger in the, in the nail print and he has him put his hand in the side. And Thomas then believes. If you remember, Jesus was like, is that really all it takes? Or really, haven't all I've done before? Shouldn't that really have gotten it? But it did, and it took, and Thomas believed. But it's after this encounter, it appears that some of the disciples are alone. Peter announces, uh, they gather together, and they're alone uh, after this encounter with Thomas, and they find a group of disciples gathered, Peter Thomas, Nathaniel, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples. They were together. And I believe that what they were doing together was processing all that they had been experiencing. Can you imagine really what they've gone through? This is an uh, incredible roller coaster up and down, you know, riding in triumphantly one, one day, being put to death on, the, on the, that uh, next weekend, 
and then on three days later, having him uh, rise from the dead and, and meeting with them and doing incredible works. And they're trying to, trying to just put it all together. And as they're together, Peter makes this great announcement. Peter announces, I am going fishing. I mean, really? Is that what you would say? Now, if Phil Porter was here, he would say, absolutely, that's what we would do. But I just kind of trying to get my head around that. I mean, they just had encounters with the risen Christ. And all they can think about is going fishing. But I do like what one writer that I read gave me a kind of an inkling and an understanding of what might have been taking place. And I do think the disciples at this point started to understand the teaching of Jesus that he was not setting up an earthly kingdom, but he was setting up an eternal spiritual kingdom, one that we, we still are so uh, uh, unaware of all that, the, that that means and what Jesus wants. And it could be they thought, well, he's resurrected. It doesn't appear we're going to set up any kind of kingdom here. We're not setting up any revolt. We're not going to be in any place of authority. We need to survive. We need to provide for our families. And so I think that's why they went back fishing. I mean, after all, that was their profession before following Jesus, before they laid it all down and followed him. It was natural for them to go back to what they knew. I wonder just a bit if it wasn't maybe a little bit of therapy for Peter as well. When we're struggling with things, we all have ways of dealing with that. And, and Peter, it appears, loved to fish. He, that was his, his vocation. And I think Peter is still kind of reeling from his denial of knowing Jesus. i got to believe it was still haunting him. He's still wrestling with that. He thought, man, I just need to get out on the water. I just need to do some fishing. I just need to clear my head. Well, the other disciples decided to go with Peter to fish. They return to something they have known how to do their whole life. Yet what's the scripture say? They fished all night and caught nothing. None of their training, none of their skills, none of their old tricks produced any results. So the night is over and as the sun started to rise and as they were about to head back into shore, someone calls out to them. They did not know this was Jesus at first. Now, I don't know if they just couldn't see or, you know, through the morning haze or if like the two on Emmaus where Jesus kept his identity from them. But what they heard was someone calling to them and saying, friends. What a, what a great word. Friends. He says, you don't have any fish. Now, if I'm one of the disciples in the boat, I've fished all night. It's empty. It's clear. What do you think is going through their mind? Is this really a friend or just someone mocking us? I mean, it was obvious they had no fish. And for me, I might have responded, responded with, thank you, here's your sign. Others will get that later. The disciples were respectful and they simply said, no, we don't. Then Jesus, this one whom they don't know, we know as Jesus, tells him, I'll tell you what, let's try one more thing. Cast your nets on the right side. Jesus tells them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat and they will find fish. And so they did. I mean, after all, they tried everything they knew. Why not give it one last shot? They were out there all night. What's it going to hurt to throw it on the other side? Maybe this person has some kind of insight. And when they cast the net on the other side, they caught a record number of fish so big they could not haul it in. Then their eyes were open, and the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Peter, hearing this, plunged into the sea to go see the Lord, leaving the other disciples, by the way, to haul in the large catch. We might give Peter a lot of uh, gruff sometimes for his hastiness, but he knew what he was doing on this one. Well, when they got to Jesus on the shore, they found him cooking a charcoal fire. And on it, he had fish and bread. Jesus tells them, bring some of their fish and to have what? Some breakfast. What was he inviting them to do? Sit down at the table. Now, not a literal table. But sit down with me and have this one last breakfast. Why the need for this last breakfast? We all know why we had to have the last supper. Why this last breakfast? Well, I think it was just time spent with friends. 
It's one of the things Jesus was doing was connecting and letting them know that he still wanted to be their friend. I mean, he called out to them, friends. Jesus, in telling them where to cast their nets, was reminding them of his power, his authority, and a reminder that he will make provision for all our needs. But I must wonder if maybe the most significant reason for the breakfast was to prepare Peter for a difficult but necessary conversation. A conversation that would help Peter to find forgiveness, restoration, and calling. To love Jesus, to feed and shepherd his sheep. Peter was not to return to what he had always known. Peter and the other disciples have a new vocation to carry on the work of Christ. I love this next picture that kind of gives us that understanding. Just Jesus and Peter alone, speaking to one another, being honest with each other, Jesus asking him some difficult questions, and Jesus responding, or Peter responding in kind. And this is a vastly different conversation that they had at the Last Supper. Uh, Consider that conversation that they had together. Uh, The meal we call the Last Supper, where Jesus taught them about serving one another in humility. Jesus taught them about what was going to happen. This was the time Jesus instituted the memorial that we just celebrated. And we have that memorial and we celebrate it and Jesus gives us that instruction so that we never forget his sacrifice of his body that was broken and his blood that was shed, that we could have forgiveness of sin and in that providing redemption for all. This supper is where Jesus spoke of his betrayer, Judas, and it's also where Jesus rebuked Peter and his boastfulness. And this is where he told Peter and prophesied that before the night was over, Peter would deny Christ. That's, this last breakfast helped clarify all that Jesus had taught them, not just in that last supper, but all, but especially for Peter. The last breakfast brought forgiveness, restoration of Peter, and giving a new command to Peter for his purpose in life, to love Jesus and to feed his sheep. He restored Peter, and ultimately, Jesus calls all of his followers, all those who claim to be his disciple, to carry on the mission, the mission of appealing to this world on Christ's behalf to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. Now, one element of the resurrection story that John does not include is the ascension. But I don't think we can tell this story without mentioning the ascension. You know, we need to be grateful to the other gospel writers, and aren't we glad that we have these different perspectives that have included it for us, like Mark and Luke, and then Luke in in Acts. The ascension for us has so much implication. This is the time where Jesus tells them of the promise that he will send them, uh, that he will send to them in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who will comfort, who will convict, who will strengthen and empower This is the one who will come and allow for Christ's followers to live faithfully and righteously in the kingdom of God. The ascension is where the promise is made that even though Jesus was leaving for now, he would one day return. Oh, I can't believe I didn't get an amen. Let me say that again. This is a promise that he made that even though Jesus was leaving for now, that he would one day return. Thank you. We look forward to that, don't we? Jesus will return, and he will gather all those who have given their life to Christ. And guess what? He's gathering them to come to another feast. John tells us of this other feast when he recorded the revelation that Jesus gave him in the book that we call Revelation about the things that are to come. John records for us in Revelation 19, Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. John records these words of Jesus. Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he goes on to say, these words of God are true. Jesus brings us all the way back to another table, another feast to welcome us into eternity. It is true, 
And once again, we will sit with Jesus at a feast as his bride. Don't you love that description? I mean, I know I'm supposed to be the groom. But you think about it. You know, I just did a wedding last weekend, and boy, the bride gets everything, right? She rules the day, rules that whole thing. Uh, It's a little different here. In, In fact, the groom cried through the whole ceremony. He barely got out the vows, the ring exchange. They even wrote their own vows. It really was just pretty special. He knew how blessed he was. And I think that's how we will be. We will just be overwhelmed. But it's going to be grateful that we get to sit at his table as his chosen one. But I like the fact that he calls us his bride, but there are other names Jesus refers to us. And I like these names too, and it is a reminder to me that as Jesus refers to us with these names, he's not only characterizing us, but he's also in that giving us a call and purpose in life. From the Old Testament through the New Testament, we are called the redeemed, the brethren, the sons of light, lambs, sheep, disciples, fellow heirs, heirs of God, sons of God, fellow partakers, fellow citizens, fellow members, children of light, saints, believers, chosen race, holy nation, God's own possession, royal priesthood, flock, little children, young men, fathers, children, children of God, bond servants, and kingdom of priests. Not sure that's in a, inclus- or a total list, but those are wonderful names that he refers to you and I as. And think about Jesus calling us a joint heir with him of all that heaven has to offer. Now, while he has those names for us, we have a lot of names for Jesus as well. I'm only going to mention three of them today, and they're my favorite. And I get to pick because I'm the one here. (laughs) Three of my favorite names for Jesus are Savior, Lord, and Friend. We will be gathered by Jesus as his friends to spend eternity with him. In a place, again, turning to John's record in Revelation, a place where Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more grief, no crying or pain, because the previous things have passed away. Why do we continue to tell this story? To always be reminded of what Jesus has done and the hope we have in him. We tell this story to be encouraged and strengthened for our mission as the ambassadors of Christ. That we would carry out this mission as ambassadors of Christ, pleading on his behalf for others to be reconciled to God. We continue to tell the story because we're telling the story of our friend. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge in it, but the inspiration, the reminder, Lord, the record of all that you have done on our behalf. Lord, may we be found as truly a bride who has prepared herself, one who will be presented without spot or blemish. And may we be a group that gets gathered one day that just shares stories about how we share the story and and maybe someone even come up to us in that gathering and saying, I was there the day you told the story of Jesus, and it changed my life forever. Lord, we know how our lives have been changed. And Father, we are forever grateful for that. Lord, it's not hard for some of us to look and see what our lives would be without you. And I would say some of us would say we may not even be here today. But because of your grace and your mercy, you're rescuing us from our sins, restoring us, making us whole. Father, we fall into an intimate relationship with you. And we accept this mission of yours because we know what it's done in our lives and how it's transformed us. And so, Lord, we gladly, for you, my friend, will take up our cross daily and we'll follow you. And we'll go out into this world, not beaten down or our, 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 our subdued by the world, but we go as your ambassadors, as your official voice, And we make the appeal to this world.
be reconciled to God. Become his friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.